The Silent Hill HD Collection came out on March 20th, 2012 to almost universal hatred from the Silent Hill community. This was due to various things like artistic changes, script changes, the new voice acting, the new HD textures, and a wide array of bugs, ranging from an annoying sound glitch when you fire a handgun to an unstable frame rate, to game ruining issues like freezing and the voice acting becoming out of sync with the on-screen characters. And if this is how a god of mercy acts, I don't want to see any more of him. Because of all these problems, Twin Perfect came out with a video dedicated to documenting them and placed the blame for everything wrong with the game squarely on one person. Tom Hewlett. It wasn't enough for him to be the producer of the HD collection. He wanted to leave a Tom Hewlett scented stain on the work of the original team. His recasting and rewriting of the script shows us that he sees the creative decisions made by Team Silent as mistakes and that he knows better than them about their own game. By checking the credits of the game, you can see that I'm not even the guy in charge. Yes, you are. Why can't you address these issues? I'm sure some of the responsibility should fall on Devin Chatsky, but Tom has situated himself above Devin on the ladder. Anybody above him is concerned with budget and deadlines and who is or isn't doing their job. But creative decisions go no higher than Tom Hewlett. Tom Hewlett, we love Silent Hill more than you do because we think they were perfect games as they were. Even if we didn't think they were perfect, we would still love every flaw you perceive them to have. Are you just trying to heap more blame on a Tom Hewlett for things he has no control over? You know, he didn't ruin the series as you guys like to think. No control? He had total control over every creative decision, but it's funny you should single him out because we've laid the mantle of responsibility on Christoph Gans, William Mortell, whoever is in charge at Climax over there, and Double Helix, and most of all, Akiriyama Oka. We didn't say Tom Hewlett ruined Silent Hill. I think you just hear what you want to hear. But he's in charge now. You know what happens when a Japanese company fails? The person in charge resigns. So you want Tom Hewlett to lose his job? I can't believe you'd want that to happen to someone. We didn't say that, and anyone who thinks we said that is a moron. But you're twisting my words and missing the point again, which is that the one in charge is supposed to take responsibility. Like in the military. So, armed with this misinformation and really odd views about how companies should be run, Silent Hill fans got angry and lashed out at the scapegoat Twin Perfect aimed them at. Despite Tom only being in charge of the voice acting, despite Tom being listed as only the associate producer in the game's credits, despite the myriad of issues plaguing the game not being any one person's fault, and most depressingly, despite Tom's genuine attempts to fix the game prior to release, as he explained on the Cannon Rinse podcast. So Downpour is finished. It's not out yet, but it's finished. HD Collection is winding down. Uh, I'm about to take time off because my wife is having surgery. And so I think I'm going to play HD Collection one time through and make any notes of serious bugs that they need to fix because it's almost done. And like, I know it's I know it's not ready. So as I'm not this is not part of my job. I'm just doing it. I know Devin will appreciate it. He's, you know, he's the producer running it, so let's do this. So I made a note. I, I'm going to say 75 bugs. It's, it's around there somewhere. I don't remember the, the exact amount. Around 75 bugs. I leave. It finishes. I'm back for a month or two. My wife has another surgery, so I'm out again when it comes out. So I check online. And Hill's out. Cool. People are not happy about the HD collection. So I, I write an email. Again, I'm on my, still on my last week off for my wife's surgery leave. I write an email to my bosses saying, what's happening are we going to do anything? Can we do anything? We need to patch it. Like, this is, it sounds bad. They say, come pick up your copy from work and then play through it again on your personal time and make a list of all the, the, the important, the things we would need to fix. Like, okay, there's little bugs. We're not going to fix them, but like the major bugs that impact the quality and are, and are pissing people off. So I bring it home. My wife says, you know, okay, it's fine. So I play through it. Obviously I'd seen online, like the fog on the lake is crap, but I playing through and I get, I get through Silent Hill 2, and I look at my list, and I think, this list looks awfully familiar. Um, so I finish it. I go back to work. I check the list I'd made. They're the mm. same list. Tom would even be blamed for not using Silent Hill 2 and 3's original PlayStation 2 source code when he informed everybody that the code used for the HD collection wasn't the original Gold Master code. Konami is run by a bunch of inepturators who can't seem to hold on to the most important part of the game's development. The source code. It feels like Tom is submitting this information as an excuse, but there's no excuse for missing source code. Inexcusable. So here we go. We got Silent Hill 2, development bill, July 25th, 2001. Do not distribute 
Do not make it. Who gives a shit? All right. What do we got here? We got Silent Hill 3. Development build June 2nd, 2003. Does it say do not distribute? Do not. I don't give a shit about that. Okay, what is it? Important bug SM. No one's gonna give a shit about that. It's, it's a fucking buzz. All right, I'm Tom Hewlett. I'm a doctor. The issue here is that at the time Silent Hill 2 was made, it was still common practice for Japanese game companies to not archive their source code for games. Yes, you heard us right, and yes, it sounds absolutely nuts, but bear with us here. It became clear right. that the developer did not have the original source code to work with because Konami okay. had, lo had lost access to the original source code. Not having source code is a, a common problem with Japanese developed games for a variety of reasons. So I'm not trying to implicate anybody. This has been a constant problem I've known about my entire career. It's mm -hmm. just a thing that happens there for some reason. We also confirmed this with Jeremy Blaustein, who had a similar experience with this practice of trashing original source code. At the time, and I don't know what the practices are now, but it was standard practice then for a team to throw away their code. It was a security thing. Yeah, they threw away their code. They never reused it. And um, it was different from game to game. It was a standard practice, what, the, what, what all the teams, at least Konami, did then. And um, they were all doing it. So... Uh, the fact that code was thrown away is not surprising in any way. This topic even came up recently on Giant Bomb's podcast. I go back to the stories I heard from, you know, someone at Capcom back in the day when they wanted to do a remaster of a game. Like literally the game's source code only existed as a stack of printouts yeah. that they had to OCR back in uh, I know, I know, to, to do. I know I've, with. I've mentioned that one up article before. I don't know if it's even still available about like the 90s JRPG development scene and how like mm. yeah, Square would not back up any of no, their source code. No, of course not. Like they know? literally deleted it all at the end of the project because they were just like, why would we ever need this again? Exactly. Like the game is done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of that stuff is just flushed down the drain. Furthermore, Japanese games journalist Kenji Ono kindly confirmed for us that this wasn't a Konami exclusive problem. Japanese developers didn't have any practice of keeping source code after shipping in the 90s because they thought there was no value in keeping it. At that time, the main platforms were SNES and PS1. Especially in the SNES age, developers programmed games in assembly language, written for limited hardware, and it was difficult to reuse that source code. In addition, most programmers didn't want to read source code written by other programmers. In the PS1 era, program language shifted to C and the source code could be used in other products. But the situation didn't change much because machine power was limited. It's different from Western culture because they programmed on PC, which was more versatile. This practice changed in the PS2 era in Japan when developers started using some libraries and middlewares. In the PS3 era, they understood the value of a game engine and started to use it in their products in the multi-platform business. They started the download business after shipping, so Japanese developers more seriously started to keep source code after shipping. I agree that Konami has a secretive culture, but most Japanese developers were the same in the 90s. They focused on merging hardware power with a cool way of programming, but didn't care to keep it after shipping. In looking toward the future, they forgot about preserving the past. It's the same even now, and affects the poor video game archives in Japan. The government and academics want to keep a legacy, but most developers are hesitant. Another perfect example to bring up here, which luckily worked out far better than Silent Hill's HD collection, is the remaster for Kingdom Hearts, the HD 1.5 remix. It sounds like creating Kingdom Hearts HD 1.5 remix has been significantly more laborious than it needed to be, as the original assets for the game were lost some time ago. That's according to the title's director, Tetsuya Nomura. Kingdom Hearts 1 was created a long, long time ago, so actually the original data was missing already, he explained. It was lost, so we had to research, and we had to dig out from the actual game what was available and recreate everything for HD. We had to recreate all the graphics, and it was actually not that easy. It's worth pointing out that not only was the source code goof-up committed by another Japanese company other than Konami, but it was with a game that was contemporaneous with Silent Hill 2. Kingdom Hearts came out in 2002 and was remastered in 2014. Silent Hill 2 was released in 2001 and remastered in 2012. Basically, the plot is this. The 80s sucked, nobody knew how to preserve games, and there was no incentive to figure it out anyway. This attitude naturally led to the situation in the late 90s and early 2000s, where, not predicting the demand for HD remasters in 10 years' time, the source codes for Silent Hill and Kingdom Hearts and others were not properly archived. And those are just the ones that we know about, because the companies admitted to losing the code. Just think about how many companies were probably too proud or too secretive to admit to a goof-up of this magnitude. So to blame Tom, as some fans did for losing the source code for Silent Hill 2 and 3, is simply uninformed and ignorant. 
But that didn't stop them from ceaselessly berating Tom at every opportunity about it and the various other issues with the game. Things got so bad that Twin Perfect had to add a disclaimer to their video, distancing themselves from the anger that they had stoked. Disclaimer, the comments made toward Konami staff or Tom Hewlett in this video belong to Twin Perfect and are personal opinions only. Twin Perfect is not responsible for any personal comments, attacks, or other such backlash made by third parties toward Tom Hewlett. Which would be a little bit more believable had they not had this call to action in their video. Please, get angry because there's nothing left to do but get angry. Why aren't people lighting car fires over this stuff. So if Tom wasn't to blame for everything wrong with the HD collection, who was? Yeah, who was twirling their mustaches going, Mwahaha, I can't wait to ruin this franchise. Well, the answer is a little messy. Without a doubt, there were problems with the game's functionality, and those fell on the shoulders of the HD collection's developers, Hijink Studios. Who is this mysterious unknown studio, you may ask? Well, Hijinx came into the world as Phoenix Soft Mobile in 1998 and changed their name to Hijink Studios around 2000. At first, their resume was mainly cell phone games like Jammed at Casino and the MVP Baseball series. Later, they'd branch out to the Nintendo DS and PS3 with Touchmaster and Vandal Hearts. But yeah, anyway, it's not an impressive resume, judging by the reviews. Certainly not one that demonstrates a background in HD remastering, so what gives? Why did Konami give them the opportunity to jump on a hotly anticipated HD collection for Silent Hill 2 and 3? Tom, right? Probably Tom. I bet it's him. It's yeah, yes, absolutely it's Tom, Tom. Obvi obviously. I mean, who else could it be? I don't know any of their names. No, the decision about which developer to use is above my pay grade. And yes, we know that this is Tom Hewlett's word we're asking you to listen to, but hey, if you know any other game dev folks that want to go on the record about this kind of specific high-level decision-making and whether that's typical for a large game company like Konami, we would love to talk to you and make a follow-up video if we've messed up any facts here. Hit us up at thegreatdebate at gmail.com or in the comment section below. But okay, let's assume here that Tom isn't a big dumb liar. In which case, the blame is soundly shifted to, again, Konami as a company and not one single dude. On top of not having the relevant experience to make an HD port of two beloved horror classics, Hijinx had to deal with a lot of issues from Konami management like Tom did, including lack of time and money. Rely on Horror recently spoke to an anonymous source that worked on the HD collection who talked about the project's woes. The most damning piece of info being the thing that we brought up earlier, the lack of a final gold master code. Question. What exactly did everyone have to work with in terms of source code and final assets. Once the project kicked off, Konami provided the source assets that had been archived after the original release on PlayStation 2. These were the only assets available, and as far as we knew going in, the completed final code. However, after digging into the code and assets, it was obvious these were not final. Whoever archived it must have done it before final submission, or worked with incomplete data. Nobody really knows by virtue of it being so long ago. Needless to say, there were many unfinished elements. So it seems that even if Hijinx had proper experience with HD remasters, they would have still been set up to fail with the Silent Hill HD collection project. At the very least, they were in over their heads as a studio. So considering the results that came of the HD collection project, Konami cut ties with Hijinx and they've never been seen again. Just kidding! Konami absorbed the company! Weird! Konami truly moves in mysterious ways. We learned this information by finding people who previously worked at Hijinx on LinkedIn, uh, who were not going to show for obvious pitchforky reasons, and trace their work history after Hijinx. Sure enough, Konami OCDS, which stands for Orange County Development Studios, is on most Hijinx employees' resumes immediately after Hijinx Studios in July of 2012. This is shortly after the HD collection came out on March 20th, 2012. But why would Konami absorb the HD collection developers? What would Konami, popular trend knower, have them work on? Konami decided to make Facebook games. And as we know now, Facebook games are the future and everyone plays them all the time and they make lots of money. Uh, so um, they devoted, they made several divisions of Facebook developers. Um, one of them was they took our American production division and converted it to a Facebook developer. So I got the title of designer, which was cool. Because I wanted to be a designer, mm. but we were couldn't settle on which Facebook games to make. And then I was told to make a casino Facebook game, um, which was, again, a, an unfilled niche in the market. Um, it was very sad. And then WayForward um, had an opening for a director. And so I jumped on that really fast. <laughs> 
Confirming with Tom's work history on LinkedIn, it becomes clear that the internal Facebook division at Konami that Tom is talking about in this interview was, in fact, Konami OCDS. So Tom just mentioned in that interview clip that he left Konami for another job, but boy howdy do I remember Silent Hill fans celebrating the schadenfreude of him finally getting sacked, fired for his incompetence and his sabotaging of the Silent Hill franchise. Oh wait, he left voluntarily for a cool opportunity. Well then, that's not juicy revenge at all, is it? Well, for the record, Tom left Konami in January of 2013, just so you know how all this stuff plays out chronologically from here on out. Tom left Konami to work at WayForward, with whom he had previously worked on Contra 4 and Silent Hill Book of Memories. Tom talked about this on Kane and Rinse. So I did Book of Memories with Konami, Silent Hill, um, and we got WayForward to develop it. Primarily because I'd worked with them, I knew they were good people. Um, they'd done a game called Lit on WiiWare. So I knew they could do atmospheric stuff. And Konami was having trouble finding developers for this, and I just didn't want it to go to a weird developer. It was already, again, this, this is Book of Memories, so uh, it was already a strange project. One week my boss said, hey, you can produce another Silent Hill. It's for this Vita thing. You can do whatever you want. And I made a really cool pitch about how to do Silent Hill on this touchscreen. Mm. And then a week later, his boss said, uh, it should be a dungeon crawler. So... Then it was a dungeon yeah. crawler because that was the big boss. Um, yeah, and then, was, yeah, odd. <laughs> Way forward, and I were were saddled with this. How do you, how do you make a Silent Hill dungeon crawler? And then we did the best that we could with that task. Here you can see the pressure that Konami would put on Tom to do things their way. Make a game for the Vita, make it Silent Hill, and make it a dungeon crawler. Tom didn't decide any of that stuff. He had bosses, he had assignments. He was never the end-all be-all of Silent Hill like many fans have declared or implied. And if you thought Konami treated Tom poorly, just wait till you see how they treated other employees. So it's 2014, about a year since Tom left Konami. PT, the playable teaser for Hideo Kojima and Guillermo del Toro's new Silent Hill game called Silent Hills, gets released to mass praise. Things seem great for a few months. Then Konami fires Hideo Kojima, Silent Hills gets cancelled, and then Konami kicks us when we're down and makes some Silent Hill and Metal Gear patch slot machines, proving that Konami Corporation have no interest in anything other than their bottom line to the extreme. Yes, all game companies care about making money in one way or another, but the reasoning behind the decisions Konami was making was absolutely sordid. See, Konami's earlier focus on mobile and gambling was due to simple profit generation. Why did Konami decide to go so heavy into patch slot and pachinko machines? Well, let's start at the beginning. Did you know that Japan is um, weird about gambling? Gambling in Japan is generally banned by the Criminal Code Chapter 23. However, there are several exceptions, including betting on horse racing and certain motorsports. This is why pachinko machines and other gamey type gambling loopholes exist. They're not technically gambling. In Pachinko, when a player's ball makes it into a special hole to activate the slot machine and a jackpot is made, they are rewarded with more balls. Players can exchange the balls for prizes of different value at a booth in the parlor. Money cannot be awarded at pachinko parlors, as this would be in violation of the criminal code. However, players almost always exchange pachinko balls for special tokens, usually slits of gold encased in plastic, and then sell them at a neighboring shop for cash. Usually such shops are also owned by the parlor operators, but as long as the winners do not receive cash in the parlor, the law is not broken. And patchy slot games are basically the same as pachinko, but with slots and metal tokens instead of pinballish action that pays out in silver balls. 2015 is when Konami's pachinko move was happening, starting with Castlevania and Silent Hill machines, then the Metal Gear patch a slot one year later. This happened around the same time that a ton of legislation was going through the system to lessen the grip of the gambling ban. Basically, folks have been trying to get casinos and gambling in general legalized in Japan for quite a while, for at least about 20 years. As of the time of this video's release, only pretty recently has casino resort gambling been legalized in Japan. And right now on Konami's amusement business page, most of the games featured are actually gambling adjacent, except for Dance Dance Revolution. Sunaga Lota is roulette, Mahjong Fight Club 2 is obviously Mahjong, which is a game very often associated with gambling, and Magical Halloween 5 and Metal Gear Solid are basically just video slots. 
And on this page, Konami lays out a lot about how gambling, uh, I mean, casino gaming, seems to be a big focus for them. So what does all this have to do with Silent Hill? Well, as I mentioned before, two of Konami's biggest franchises have now been converted into pachinko games, Silent Hill and Metal Gear. Konami doesn't want to make games. Konami wants to make money, which is also the reasoning for their push to Facebook games at first and then later mobile games. This is likely due to both platforms' generally low cost and short time frame turnarounds combined with extremely high earning potential via microtransactions. Microtransactions would also show up in Metal Gear Solid 5 and in Metal Gear Survive, likely the result of a push to increase their return on investment via that same mobile strategy. Soon after Konami's falling out with Kojima, the state of the company's work environment would be exposed. The expose included stuff like Konami management monitoring how long employees were taking breaks, to publicly shaming those who were gone too long, to taking away some employees' internet access, to demoting people to mindless, repetitive tasks so that they might quit on their own out of despair. And after Hideo Kojima wasn't allowed to receive an award Metal Gear Solid V had won for Best Action Adventure Game at the 2015 Game Awards, suddenly it was common knowledge that Konami management was just... maybe not good? Maybe? Can we get on the same page here, finally, about Konami not being good? I'm kinda getting a bad vibe. Just, you're only getting one bad vibe? Metal Gear Solid V got all sorts of donked up, and it was kinda not even all the way finished, partly because they locked Hideo Kojima, the game's director, in a separate room away from his developers for the last six months of the game's production. And then they fired the mega auteur that every gamer on Earth worships because he was costing them too much dang money. Maybe Konami likes money more than games. So maybe, just maybe, the destruction and death of Silent Hill wasn't all Tom Hewlett's fault? So, that's the tragedy of Tom Hewlett, a fan-turned-producer for one of his favorite series, vilified for simply doing his job the best that he could. A job so toxic he could be punished or fired at any moment for any reason by his employer, all while consistently being ignored or denied funding to do that job to save money, and because of that became the whipping boy for all of the perceived flaws with the newer Silent Hill games. Tom was truly damned if he did, and damned if he didn't. I still get angry emails about it. I haven't worked at Konami in four years, everybody. Four years. Yeah. Um, it was very hard because at the time, especially with these later ones, you may have guessed that internal Konami things were not great. And so, one, I was always seen as like this fanboy guy. Like, why does Tom so care so much about this canon? Like, these fans and like, what's his deal? And then externally, their fans are seeing me like, oh, Tom is this idiot in a suit, and he lucked into this position, and he doesn't know games, and he hates me, and he wants to ruin Silent Hill. So it was very frustrating. I had nowhere to, like, someone believes in me, right? It's so sad that Tom got the blame for what happened to the Silent Hill franchise when he was one of the people at Konami who cared about making good games rather than increasing bottom lines. In fact, Tom was constantly worried about how fans would receive Silent Hill projects despite being told repeatedly to not care about what the fans wanted. He wanted to make good games, and not just for himself, but for us, the jaded and bitter Silent Hill fandom. It seems strange to look back on this whole mess. After Silent Hill 4, fans were asking for the series to end and saying Konami should have shelved it. But when PT came out, suddenly everyone was anticipating a Silent Hill game again. And then, after Tom Hewlett was no longer part of the company, Konami's awful management and toxic environment caught up with even Hideo Kojima. And yet we're supposed to believe people like Twin Perfect when they say Tom is to blame for the Silent Hill franchise's downfall? Because even without Tom, Konami has continued being Konami, messing up games and development, firing their top talent, making it more terrible to work there, and creating games with their IPs that are utterly baffling. Suddenly, the Silent Hill fan service dungeon crawler Book of Memories makes a lot more sense when the half ass microtransaction filled Metal Gear Survive exists, doesn't it? You have to pay for extra save slots in that game, for God's sake. And we don't even have time to talk about Survive's hidden messages that relay its developers' disdain for Konami management, which read like a hostage victim's desperate plea to the outside world. So, why talk about this years old drama? Setting the record straight is part of it, but what happened to Tom is still happening to people involved in game development to this day. 
like when a former Bioware animator was blamed for the awful animations in Mass Effect Andromeda. And just like in Tom's case, there was a myriad of complex issues compounding the Andromeda project, yet one person was singled out for the blame. This same situation plays out over and over. Fans see problems with a game or series, identify the supposed singular source of those problems without knowing the full context, and attack them. We have not learned from what happened to Tom and others like him, and that's a problem. Part of the solution here is that we as an audience need to recognize that large projects like games and films are not the product of one single person, even when the auteur narrative is pushed on us, like with Kojima. Yes, he seems to be an amazing director, but he and his team made those games, not just one guy. And he still had to answer to Konami, and rumor has it, was fired for skirting the rules and pissing off the top brass too much, but that's for another video. Many people are in charge of various aspects of a project. Some people are coding the game, some are in charge of animation, and some are in charge of the vision. It's a team effort. As an audience, we generally like to keep things simple. So we look to one person as the creator of a work, George Lucas and Star Wars, Stanley Kubrick and The Shining, Hideo Kojima and Metal Gear Solid. While it's true that a director is in charge of a project's overall direction and shoulders some of the credit or blame should that project succeed or fail, this is not the optimal way of interfacing with media and generally dismisses the hard work others on the team put into it. This oversimplification doesn't usually become a problem until someone is scapegoated as the source of all of a work's faults, especially when the director or producer on the project are answering to higher-ups that slap creative mandates onto the project that, if unmet, could cost them their jobs. Such was the case with Tom Hewlett and Konami. Now, don't get us wrong, we're not saying no one should criticize anything anymore. We're not even saying people shouldn't be criticized for the work they put into a project. What we're saying is that on team projects, it's rare that one specific person is to blame for all that project's issues. And sometimes, those issues are a result of forces we as an audience can't see. We need to realize when we're assuming things about a project, and that we don't really know what happened behind the scenes unless we go out of our way to ask. And even then, it's hard, sometimes impossible, to delineate who exactly was the source of a creative decision. We should strive to learn the truth and be honest with ourselves enough to know when we know nothing. Otherwise, we could end up vilifying the one person who is trying to do right by us. It's also extremely important to realize that the ones who create the things you love and hate are people and don't deserve harassment or death threats for simply making something you dislike. Separate the creator from their creation, criticize the creation, and avoid vilifying any single person for the work of a team, especially when you don't know how that team works. That's particularly important for anyone making YouTube videos. YouTube has become a dumping ground for videos containing misinformation and lazy research. If you make YouTube videos, aim to spread the truth by bolstering your opinions with as much information as you can get your hands on. And if you watch YouTube videos, remember to not take them as gospel. We all all make mistakes, so look for video creators who go out of their way to point out their mistakes. Look for people who want to tell other sides of a story, not just their own. Look for nuance. But above all, look for the truth by corroborating evidence and using common sense. If someone is being blamed for all of the problems with the game, maybe take a look at the credits of that game to see what role they played. And if you find evidence that paints a different story than is being peddled, speak up. Twin Perfect wasn't the only force that directed fan vitriol at Tom, but they played a major role. They used their platform to spread misinformation in order to actively antagonize a man for doing his job. And it's for that reason that Fungo, former member of Twin Perfect, actually apologized to Tom on Twitter, telling him, During my time with the real Silent Hill experience, you were painted poorly. I do take blame as I was involved. I would like to say that I am very sorry. If you were someone that said something nasty to Tom or wished him ill or saw other people doing these things and said nothing, we hope you take some time to digest what we said. Put yourself in Tom's shoes. And if you decide what you said or didn't say wasn't good enough, consider apologizing to him. Because even if you disagree with him or you don't like the work he's done, he didn't deserve how he was treated by Konami and by us. If Fungo can apologize given all the things he's said and done as part of Twin Perfect, you can too. The way to change isn't ignoring what happened. It's acknowledging it, admitting it was wrong, learning from that mistake, and moving on. Because if we can learn to be better Silent Hill fans, maybe we can be better people too.